Okay, we're live. Um, welcome to another episode. I think we're on episode eight or nine of the Tom and John show. Um, we're being br- this week. We're being brought uh, brought without Tom, so it's just the John show this week. And <laughs> and with me we have uh, a professor and assistant dean of academic affairs from Virginia Tech, uh, Eric Irvin. Um, Eric, I'll give you a, a brief bio, and then I'll let you uh, talk about yourself a little bit. But um, so uh, I know that you grew up in Iowa and that you went to Iowa State and you've been around the golf industry for quite a long time, worked on golf courses in high school and college and even uh, a short stint as an assistant superintendent before then um, going back to school. You went back to Colorado State, is that right? Yep. Yeah, Colorado State and received his master's and PhD and did a lot of work on um, drought, fertility and the use of PGRs, which probably at the time was pretty um early for the use of PGRs and turf. Yeah, I'm old. Yeah, right right at the beginning of Primo getting on the market. Yeah, I didn't mean it that way that you're old, but I do think that, I mean, Primo has been around since, I, I don't even know when it really started, but. About, about 93, I think. Okay, so it seems like it's been around forever for, for those who are using it now, but it really, that was when a lot of the research was going on. Um, you then went to the University of Missouri and were a state turf grass extension specialist before taking the position at Virginia Tech where you've moved up through the ranks and you've been there 15 years and now sort of kind of double duty, which I think we're going to get into later in the show. You do a little bit of double duty with your research in um, turf grass culture and physiology, but also your new role as assistant dean of academic affairs, which is awesome. I'm excited when I see people move up through uh, the leadership roles at the university because not everybody wants to do it. It's kind of like you're know, the unsung hero and, and maybe hated by a lot of people um, when you take those roles. But um, why well, don't you, you can't hate me. Plus, you know, turf guys running the show. Come on. Yeah, I, I love that. I think um, it's funny around here. Penn State has such a large turf you know, program and it's it's worldwide known. But um, but people kind of like to just let us do our own thing and don't want us involved in, in leading other groups so much. So it's pretty interesting. But um, So I'm interested to hear about it. And um, what I'd like you to do, um, maybe expand a little bit on your bio and kind of tell me how you got into what you're doing now, and then we'll talk a little bit about your work with biostimulants as well. Okay. Well, I'll expand on my bio. Well, you heard I grew up in Iowa. Um, we... Uh, My dad was a golfer, is a golfer, and uh, got me started uh, when I was six playing golf. And I was lucky enough. We, if you know anything about Iowa, there's a nine hole course in every county. There's a hundred counties. So um, we were only two blocks away from our little nine hole course. So uh, that's where I spent all my time. And um, back then, they would actually hire folks that were under 16. And I started working in the the bag room. Well, cleaning clubs and putting up the carts. And then I graduated to uh, maintenance and had uh, had a really good uh, superintendent mentor back then who got me interested in, in turf as a career on a golf course. Um, by the time I was going to college, he was headed, he had already uh, headed to Florida to help build Grand Cypress down in Orlando. And, uh, he actually got me a job before I started Iowa State working at, at Bay Hill, uh, Arnold Palmer's place. So I, I did that in between high school and starting a semester late at Iowa State. Um, and so I always thought I was going to become a superintendent. Um, kept working in the summers at Cedar Rapids Country Club uh, in Iowa while I was at Iowa State. And uh, my boss kept telling me, okay, you finish up, uh, you're going to be my assistant superintendent because the current assistant superintendent, uh, Randy Van Fleet, had moved on to a, a head job in Illinois. And so I graduated and I was the assistant superintendent for not even a year there. And uh, he also kept telling me, hey, do you really think you want to do this as a career? Because um, we had a drought that year is the drought summer of 1988 and we were all bent grass course. We, uh, were pulling our irrigation water out of, a uh, a Creek, um, that dried up. And then we, uh, had to drill a, a well right next to the Creek next to the pump house. And I got the job of, as we hit a little bit of water, uh, with not a lot of capacity could run the pump and irrigate 
for about an hour at a time. Uh, I got to sleep out on the Cushman by the pump house and turn the pump on and off. That's when I really started thinking, maybe I don't want to be a superintendent. And hey, I really like the university experience. So uh, um, I applied to graduate school and went to Colorado State, uh, worked with Tony Kosky on uh, some drought issues. We know drought is huge in the West right now. I just heard something on NPR this morning about uh, the state of Colorado planning uh, for future water needs. And matter of fact, my master's project was funded by the Denver Water Board to set uh, irrigation uh, coefficients if you're using you know, ET to schedule your irrigation. Um, my two years of research with a line source irrigation system was all about, okay, if anybody is going to use buffalo grass, native warm seasoned out there, um, it only needs 20 to 30 percent of ET. Tall fescue needs 60 percent and Kentucky bluegrass, which was the majority grass out there for lawns back in the 90s, needs at least 80 percent of ET to maintain viability and quality under under drought. So that was that's the gist of my whole master's right there. Um, and I hope they're still using uh, that information. I know uh, they use that information to push more, uh, especially tall fescue lawns out there over the last 15, 20 years. So what's, what's crazy about that is um, thinking about how drought is kind of coming full circle now <clears throat> and California and the Southwest and Colorado, a lot of that work that people did a long time ago that was so much forward thinking um, is probably going to get used quite a bit and referenced quite a bit more than it, uh, more than it did in the last 20 years, you know? Yep, you would hope uh, there'll be increased urgency, obviously. So, uh, so that's that's some of my background, uh, really early on. But uh, I'll say that both of my jobs after getting a PhD, I started at the University of Missouri, um, have been in the transition zone. So there for three years, uh, spending a lot of time in extension visiting um, golf courses in St. Louis and Kansas City. Um, learning about uh, mixed cool and warm season golf courses, Bermuda Zoysia fairways, uh, bent grass greens that really, really struggled to, to survive the summer. Um, that was great training, not only for learning those grasses and, and stress tolerance, uh, but learning a lot about uh, summer turf grass diseases on, on bent grass. I worked with a pathologist there, Barb Corwin. We traveled around visiting a lot and I learned a lot there more than maybe I, I ever did in graduate school. So on the job training. Um, and so then when I got the opportunity to come to Virginia Tech in 2001, I, I was already familiar, um, confident in uh, my abilities in, in terms of the transition zone. And so being in Virginia for the past 15 years and continuing to work in a stressful environment for cool and warm season grasses allowed me to, you know, branch out my uh, research areas in terms of one area that we're probably not going to talk about today but that i've done a lot of work in is uh, just cold hardiness of bermuda grasses for fairways and athletic fields um and then to continue I'll have you back to do that one because that's another good topic to talk about yeah yeah as as they as the bermuda grasses both greens and fairways and, and ball fields continue to be planted farther and farther north it's becoming a, it's going to become a, a a big issue and art already is a big issue but uh there's a lot of great breeding efforts that you know with new cultivars out of oklahoma state that are making some big progress there um but if we want to get into the background of of what we're going to talk about today basically biostimulants and and plant hormones um the origin of that research you you heard i didn't really i didn't do any of that in graduate school um i obviously worked with primo um, which is an anti gibberellic acid uh, compound to slow the leaf elongation rates of, of cool season grasses and warm season grasses i worked with cool season grasses primarily um, so it's affecting the levels of an important growth hormone in the plant and uh, also has some other secondary effects in terms of increasing uh, shoot density, uh, increasing chlorophyll content, things like that, that uh, had started me thinking about other hormones. If we affect one growth hormone, gibberellic acid, is there going to be some kind of feedback uh, affecting other growth hormones? And one in particular that's responsible 
for um, enhanced chlorophyll, stay green effect, and enhanced density of turf grasses, it's cytokinins. And so as I was uh, getting ready to interview for the job at Virginia Tech and thinking about um, those type of issues, the re big reason why I was thinking about hormones was because Dr. Dick Schmidt had a 40 year career at Virginia Tech um, and I was interviewing to replace him. And in the last about 10, 15 years of his um, successful career, he was really the pioneer researcher who was getting into, can we explain any physiological effects that some of, some of the main natural ingredients and in biostimulants are having? So he mostly started working with seaweed extracts and humic acids um, and was the first one to really publish in a scientific journal some um, statistically valid uh, effects of showing, at least on cool season grasses, that yes, you can improve uh, drought and heat tolerance of these grasses when you apply uh, repeated applications of these seaweed extracts and humic acids. And so as I was studying some of his papers in the late 90s, getting ready to, to interview, I was having a lot of these thoughts about how some of these natural products could be affecting plant hormonal, hormonal balance in terms of uh, gibberellic acid, uh, auxin, and cytokinins. And so uh, once, once I got here um, and saw an opportunity, we have to look for opportunities um, as professors because as we talked about earlier, John, um, we take these jobs and the university is investing in our talent, not necessarily giving us any money to support the research that they want us to do. So we have to be entrepreneurs and find our niche areas uh, to then go out and find um, outside, mostly industry support, to support the research we want, want to do. And one big area was this biostimulant area. So I had some background in physiology, in PGRs and hormones, but not a, a huge background in it. But I saw a niche here. Um, I inherited a very um, uh, good research scientist from Dr. Schmidt. Um, it, uh, Dr. Shin Zhang, Zhang, or we can just easily call him Dr. Zhang. And I've kept him on board to help me with all of the analytical laboratory work with hormones and antioxidants and, and things over the years. And we've been a good team in this niche. And so for the last 15 years, once I got to tech, I started to, uh, what I first did, and, and we should all do this in science, is I tried to repeat some of uh, Dr. Schmidt's research and see if I could get similar results. Uh, so if it's repeatable um, and throughout with different researchers trying to do the same things, then that means hopefully when superintendents are going to try some of these products, it's going to be re repeatable on their golf courses too. So I was able to do that. I uh, immediately established a, a drought tolerance study with uh, A4, L93, and Pencross bent grasses and uh, with multiple applications every uh, two weeks in this case of seaweed extract by itself, just a, a generic form of uh, Ascophyllum notosum, which is the standard North Atlantic uh, seaweed that you'll get uh, in a lot of biostimulant products. Uh, a lot of folks will source these from Acadian sea plants in Nova Scotia as a wholesaler that then go into, you know, your standard uh, uh, Florentine, uh, Emerald Isle, um, Roots, uh, other type of products. And then so tested that alone as a generic at the rates that Dr. Schmidt had shown were effective. We can talk about those later. Uh, humic acid by itself, a standard Leonardite humic acid that you'll find on the labels of many biostimulants. Leonardite is a soft brown coal that uh, is not high quality enough coal to burn for uh, electricity. Um, so folks are looking for extra uses of it and, uh, it's long been used in, in horticulture and, and turf grass type products, um, as something that, uh, has been shown, um, uh, over 50, 60 years to be a good chelator of micronutrients, keep, uh, nutrients from precipitating out while they're in the, the jug, but also to keep those micronutrients more available for root uptake 
uh, when the product is applied. But there's a whole other thing uh, in the literature that really the first published uh, part of that story was published in uh, Soil Science Journal in 1973 showing that foliar applications of very small concentrations, what would be part per million concentrations of leonardite humic acid, uh, were able to mimic uh, the effects of auxin on root growth. And so that's something uh, Dr. Schmidt pursued and then I've pursued quite a bit over the last 15 years too. So those standard treatments, seaweed extracts by itself, humic acid by itself, and then the combination of the two, which, which he showed in three, four papers, uh, were additive in their effects on uh, root and shoot growth and stress tolerance. Um, so it's those three treatments against untreated control always equalize uh, nutrient availability. We're not looking for any nutrient effects here. See if we, um, and, and looked at those uh, three treatments under drought, uh, saw some really nice uh, effects in terms of, well, overall growth of that plant during uh, drought was in, enhanced ability of the root system that was there when the trial started, it did not decline as quickly with these treatments. Therefore, more access to water uh, as that drought progresses and therefore able to handle that drought longer. So um, we can talk more about uh, the hormones and stuff later, but that's kind of the introduction and I've continued to, to try to refine the kind of a mode of action of some of these products over time. Let me take a step back for a second <clears throat> for superintendents that are uh, maybe watching that are interested in, you know, using products and stuff. Can you exclude all the different commercially available products that are out there? Can you talk about, um, in your opinion, what the most important hormones or, um, yeah, I mean, hormones that are in turf uh, that are out there? I mean, is it specific cytokinins? Is it, you know, how important and effective is humic acid by itself? And I hear a lot of talk from people that, um, especially, you know, the propri proprietary stuff that it's the combination, it's the right ratios of these things. Can you maybe just talk about what these hormones are fundamentally supposed to do um, in turf and then um, how you see the kind of interaction? You mentioned, you know, if Primo does some inhibition of GA, what's that going to have on other hormones? Can you kind of just maybe talk on a really fundamental level on what they do? Yeah. So on a really fundamental level, um, cytokinins and auxins are the main growth hormones we're talking about here. Uh, cytokinins are made in healthy roots and are translate, translocated up uh, to the crown and the shoot system to then tell cells to divide at the crown. So if we don't have uh, an adequate amount of cytokinin in the crown, um, directing traffic, uh, then those cells don't divide from axillary buds and we don't get new tillers, we don't get new roots, we don't get new shoots, or we get much less of, of those things. So, you know, during optimum growing conditions, healthy roots, there's plenty of cytokinin naturally being made. And right now in the spring, tons of cytokinin from those healthy roots and we're getting a huge flush of dense, uh, healthy growth of, of shoots and, um, and new, new, more new root, root initiation and show, so on and so forth. The other um, important point is that auxins are made in new shoot tissues, new leaves, and they move down to the crown. And <clears throat> if there's enough auxin down there, then they will tell in conjunction with the cytokinin that's there, um, preferen preferentially, um, if auxin is a little bit stronger than the cytokinin content, so there's that balance in the crown, then new roots will be initiated. So auxin is known as a rooting hormone. If you work in plant propagation in greenhouses, um, you know, your rooting compound um, that you put those cuttings into is uh, dominated by auxin, but there's still cytokinin in there because you need that balance. If you only have auxin uh, without cytokinin, you'll actually get an, an inhibition of, of rooting. So uh, 
Yeah. So, so those are standard things. If you, there are products out on the market and in the research that we publish, we always have a synthetic form of a cytokinin or an auxin in as a positive control to compare against what's the effect of this concentration of humic acid that we're assuming is functioning uh, kind of as a natural auxin. How does that compare to this uh, indole butyric acid, which is the standard form of auxin that's used in plant propagation? Uh, how does it compare in terms of its effects on rooting? Um, so long story short, yes, we picked this positive synthetic uh, hormone controls in there. And you can find products on the turf market that will list on the label. Uh, we contain this very small percentage of, of auxin, either they name it IAA, indole acetic acid, that's the standard plant produced uh, auxin, or IBA, indole butyric acid, which is kind of the standard uh, synthetic auxin mimic of IAA. And you can find uh, products on the market that will have cytokinin in them. Auxin's easy because there's really only that one or two forms, IAA, IBA. Uh, cytokinins, uh, you, you hear plural, um, there are plural cytokinins made by plants. And so plural uh, cytokinins that you could find in products. But um, the main one that plants make that is biologically active for cells to divide and new tillers and shoots and roots to, to happen is zeatin. Um, and a, a lot of times in the plant, they'll naturally um, conjugate or, or form a more complex compound with different sugars. So one that we tend to um, quantify in our leaf tissues during our trials is one that's called zeatin riboside. So riboside's the sugar form. Um, you'll, there are others uh, called uh, isopental adenine, things like that. There's the synthetic one uh, that mimics the action of zeatin, which is called um, benzyl adenine. Um, so you, you, they're all very similar in terms of their structure and their function within the plant. So how's that so far? Yeah. Perfect. I, I was just, I wanted to give kind of a basic overview in terms of like what the major players are and the most, you know, ones that are the most important. And then you touched on it too, in terms of the, you know, that balance, whatever that balance is. Cause I see a lot of products on the market and you've tested, I'm sure all of them <clears throat> where they have, you know, one that does something and then one that does something else. And, and maybe it's just the balance of those hormones in there and, and how that triggers the plant. And I, you've done more research probably than anybody with these. So, um, so why don't you talk about some of your research that you've done, um, you know, beyond the basic stuff that you did to repeat some of Dr. Um, Schmidt's work and, um, you know, and kind of where you've gone. So you basically started this 15 years ago. And obviously every time you do a new study, new questions are, are popping up. And um, so I'm sure you've gone through a series of those, those kind of questions that you had to then answer. Yeah. Okay. Well, I back up a little bit, you know, I, I agree with you, the combination of these two um, ingredients, seaweed extract, which is the main ingredient in terms of supplying a, a natural cytokinin and humic acid or humic and fulvic acids, main ingredient for supplying some auxin, um, do have tended over and over again in our trials uh, to work better together than alone. But I will tell you that uh, we, we still have published numerous da data showing that uh, alone each one of these ingredients can have some positive effects on turf growth and, and in general um, we've mostly worked with, with bent grass in terms of improving its heat and drought tolerance. Um, so where we've gone further, um, uh, there have been companies that have funded us to, to answer some of their fundamental questions that their customers have or that they have in terms of uh, their formulations and, and quality control. So one big question we, we uh, tried to answer, and I think we came up with a pretty good answer, is um, what's the right concentration of a seaweed extract um, to spray out on your putting green and have these uh, beneficial effects? Because, hey, if 
we're, if this is a hormonal type of effect and the concentrations needed in the plant are in the part per billion range or even less that are needed to have, you know, just boost that part per billion amount of cytokinin in the leaf tissue enough that you can uh, improve drought tolerance. Uh, can't we just tell, put less of the seaweed extract in the actual bottle and, uh, and make more money? right? We're still going to charge the same price, but we have less ingredients. Um, so let's talk about it this way, because we're all used to talking about concentrations or, or rates in ounces per thousand. So the standard seaweed extract rate in our studies is three to four ounces per thousand. Okay. Whether that's a, a seaweed extract that's 8% solids or 16% solids, they're all right around there somewhere. Okay. Uh, so three to four ounces per thousand. So we did a, a trial where, okay, let's, let's apply 10 X less than that. So 0.3 ounces, for example, um, let's even apply 0.03 ounces and put these bent grasses under standard heat stress, say 95 day, 77 night, high humidity, good summer bent grass decline weather. Um, so 0.03, 0.3, three ounces. Then we went 30 ounces. Because the other thing is, well, we, we all think this, right? Especially homeowners. Well, if three ounces is good, 30 ounces is going to be better. So we did that kind of uh, rate comparison and uh, looked at rooting, looked at what was going on in terms of photosynthesis during heat stress, in terms of chlorophyll retention during heat stress, and so on and so forth, and cytokinin levels within the leaf tissues during this heat stress. And... Basically, our published work in crop science showed that uh, 0.3 ounces was pretty much equivalent to 3 ounces was equivalent to 30 ounces. We, if we go, we actually did a treatment above 30 ounces. Well, we, we had to kind of apply that as a drench to this is a pot experiment because you can't get through that, that through a nozzle. Um, we, we could see some phytotoxicity if we get above 30 ounces per thousand. Um, and we don't know why maybe, uh, well, we don't have to get into that. Uh, could be hormonal, could be something else. Um, and then we couldn't go too low either. So this research showed that, uh, yeah, you can, you can apply less and still have some of the positive benefits. Um, and but but really what you definitely have to do is this is something you know these these hormone levels are changing in response to the environment and leaf tissues are being mowed off so on and so forth um so you have to keep supplementing uh every two weeks with these applications you can't just apply once and expect good things uh because it'll the, those compounds will get broken down and, and removed fairly quickly um as growth occurs. So that's uh, something that, that we found with the seaweed extract. So that gives you a good sense of one, there's, there's 10 X safety if you do over apply. And if you get your rate too low, there's safety there in terms of you should still be able to expect uh, as long as there's a fairly consistent stress on the plant, some benefits. The other thing to back up and talk about with all these products is another thing we always do as another check on, on the effects of these materials are we always have a, a set of treatments where there's no stress. So no heat stress, uh, no water stress at all. And we look and see, well, are we having a benefit at this time when the plant is producing all the hormones and, in the balances it needs. It has all the, the carbohydrates that it needs to, to run properly. Uh, over and over again, we show there's no need for any of these uh, products when there's no stress. So, But you're, you're assuming that you know, you're, you're going to be predicting some level of stress at some point, and these things have to be applied ahead of time, right? Like you can't just go after the fact and start putting these out, or are they just as effective after the stress is there? Right. I mean, once, yeah, you need to be applying these in a preventative fashion because once you've lost, you know, say half of your root system, um, there's, these are no magic bullets to all of a sudden 
say, and, and once you've lost half your root system, you're starting to lose a lot, a lot of your density and your leaf viability. Um, and therefore, your plant is not really a good carbohydrate powerhouse to uh, have good net en energy reserves anymore. So, yeah, you can't just all of a sudden start applying these and, and trigger something and make the plant uh, use energy that it doesn't have anymore. So you're kind of uh, boosting, artificially boosting these hormone levels uh, before and during the start of any kind of stress period. And, and so it's pretty simple to think about that, where, depending on where you are in the country and things like that or the world and what your primary growing season is. But for, you know, for us in Virginia, you should be applying these basically May through September on your bent grass or bent grass poa greens. Um, one thing we might get into later that I haven't done research on because I just haven't been in that climate is ultra dwarf Bermuda greens. We know that their real stress period is not in the summer in the south. It's uh, when there's still lots of play going on through the winter, but there's low light levels. There's uh, suboptimum temperature conditions. They may still be green and growing and photosynthesizing, but their, their root systems probably are declining and becoming less viable. Therefore, uh, you're not going to be having plenty of nice new cytokinins made in those roots to do some of these things. Um, so if I was going to be studying ultra dwarf Bermuda greens in, you know, Georgia or Florida or Texas or wherever I would, I would be doing some trials looking at, uh, that October to kind of April period when there's plenty of play on these greens. Um, but not a lot of growth for recovery, not a lot of these maybe growth hormones being made. So that might be, the time to try to see if these things can be beneficial to ultra dwarf Bermuda in the future. Um, so if you had to give a recommendation to a, a superintendent, you said, obviously, you know, apply them, um, on bent grass greens, you know, May through September in the stress period. Um, <clears throat> is there, what's unique about the different, you said Emerald Island, Florentine, and I know there's others. I mean, is there something unique in those products? Is it something that they can just go buy a jug of C? kelp extract. Um, you know, you see a lot of that in the UK when I go over there. Um, sure you do. Yeah. Oh, uh, what's the uniqueness about any of these, obviously they're proprietary and they have maybe different blends, but, um, thoughts on that. Yeah. I, you know, I don't want to get into, you know, talking or endorsing different companies, products and things today, but, uh, I mean, what, what, I, what I do want to say is, um, yes, if you're a, a, uh, a superintendent who likes to read and listen to things like we're talking about today, uh, you can get into the scientific literature um, and you can figure out the rates of these ingredients and buy them kind of wholesale yourself. Uh, and that's what a lot of the guys in the UK do. I think they do it in conjunction with a lot of their consultants who travel around like our USGA green section, but they're, you know, private consultants and they'll say, Hey, you know, you need to get a 50 gallon jug of, uh, of this kelp extract. And, and you see that a lot. And, uh, so, you know, when I was in Ireland with Turfnet a few years ago, when we were stopping and talking to all the green keepers before we played their course, they'd have that 50 gallon jug of kelp. They'd, uh, say it's a tank mix of kelp, uh, uh, sulfate of ammonia, sulfate of iron, uh, maybe a little wetting agent. And, uh, there we go. That's our, our greens program and that can work and that could save you a lot of money but again you gotta uh, experiment on your own and 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 uh, figure those rates out uh, the same old thing we say about everything uh, get your intern or your assistants uh, involved in a little bit of research put out that uh, plywood blank and things like that to show yourself that you're uh, doing something good but in terms of products if you if, if you don't want to go that route and um, there are many good products on the market. I've worked with a lot of these companies um, to kind of get some scientific data behind some of the claims that they're putting putting out there. Um, all I would say is the the science may be young in in turf grass for these products, so about 20, 25 years. 
but a lot of uh, these compounds have been used in horticulture and other crops for for many more years than that. So the science is out there. And where did these companies come up with their ingredient mixes and their possible, um, you know, getting the right ratio of seaweed to humic acid to, you know, amino acids and things like that? Uh, where did they come up with those ratios? They came up with it reading the scientific literature and doing some of their own R&D in-house. Um, so what I would do is don't just listen to claims from salespeople or what's on their literature, but look on their website or ask those folks who are visiting you, um, have you done some science? Can you show me some, you know, statistically valid data? Um, maybe it's not exactly, um, in the same, uh, climate is yours, uh, maybe not all the same conditions, but, you know, have they done some science that, that really is a good backup of what they're trying to sell you? Um, yeah, they can buy you beers and be, be your friends and, and do things like that. And I think uh, good companies need to be good at, good at all those things. Um, cause there's a lot of service that's involved too, but, uh, but that's what I would look for. Um, there's, there's plenty of other companies that don't have any research behind their products that I wish would have it behind their products. Uh, cause it's, it's a market where they can make money. Uh, they can, they can look at other people's labels and, and, uh, put ingredients together and boom. So, yeah, good. Um, well, I think that was a good overview. Obviously in a half hour, we can't get into everything. Um, but before I let you go, I did want to ask, um, we had briefly touched on it in terms of your role as uh, assistant dean of academic affairs and most people that don't really know academia they they see us and say oh you teach maybe they say you do research and you know you're in turf but there's a lot more in the university system and part of that is maybe taking on leadership roles like department heads or deans or assistant deans um, tell me a little bit about, and this is me personally wanting to know, and hopefully some other people will get something out of it, but tell me a little bit about your decision to take on that leadership role, because it really does change the dynamic of your position um, in terms of where your responsibilities are um, and, and kind of how that's going for you. Uh, well, a little bit about my decision to try to, to, to move up in leadership of the university. Um, you know, wherever any of us work, I think, whether it's a, a big organization, small, medium, um, some of us and me included, I like to watch and, uh, how my organization is being run. And I like to give my input on how that organization is being run. And, um, and I'd always done that. I've always served on committees. Um, uh, you know, uh, chair of our scholarship committee, chair of our departmental curriculum committee, much more looking at much more than just what turf classes ought to be taught, but what should be taught to kids who are going to be agronomists and kids who are going to become environmental scientists and soil scientists and things like that. It's always just interested me, uh, even since I was a graduate student. Maybe that's why I stayed in and went to graduate school. Um, but even if, if you're, you know, say you're, uh, uh, a, an organization out there that owns a whole bunch of golf courses around the country. Um, you maybe have one of those personalities where, Hey, maybe I don't like how my boss, uh, is doing things and it, you can either complain about it and nothing happens, or you can decide to step up and try to be part of, of a better organization. And, and it, I decided to step up and be part of my organization, not because I was really uh, dissatisfied, but because I was looking for new challenges in my career. And that that's all it is. And, and it's, you know, the nice thing is I was able to um, make this step into administration uh, without having to give up my uh, turf teaching career, my advising of our turf students, without having to give up my whole research program, as we've been talking about today, because it's a 50% time uh, position, but I was able to to step up in administration to start learning more about how the College of Ag and Life Sciences, with three thousand students in the university um, and thirteen different majors instead of just our one major within my department, how all that works, how uh, how we can 
ho how I can hopefully have a positive effect on um, improving in my area just uh, how we approach teaching um, our students and, and getting them prepared to go out into their careers. So uh, I, ha I could do that here without having to interview someplace else and move and give up my whole turf teaching and research career. So it's been interesting that way. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, I, I can totally appreciate uh, taking on that role because you could just sit back and, and do nothing. I mean, you could not do nothing, but you could just continue down the same path that you're doing. So stepping up and kind of taking that next challenge is obviously what makes the university run because most of those type of positions are <clears throat> maybe not necessarily voluntary, but, you know, voluntary, but they, they're still, they take somebody to just step up and, and say, I'm going to do it. So that's, it's pretty good. It's awesome. Um, cool. Okay, well, that's, uh, I think, a good wrap-up of um, the episode. Um, anything you want to talk about that you've got exciting coming up? Any special trips you're taking coming up here? <laughs> well, I'm going with a group of Virginia superintendents to uh, St. Andrews here in about a week. We're going to play uh, the old course and maybe the new course, Carnoustie, Prestwick, Kings Barnes some other places. So uh, really looking forward to that. I've been to uh, Scotland once and just walked around the old course. Uh, but it was right in front of the, uh, open a few years ago. It's the opens there again this July. Uh, but I was there so close. There was no way to get on. So hoping to play for sure this, this time and, uh, and really experience, uh, some of the origins of golf with some, some good, uh, Virginia superintendent friends. So <clears throat> It's awesome. Uh, you know, I have to give credit to Stan Zontek who really brought me over there the first time and I've gone back several times since that. And so my, my shout out so that it's on camera, uh, I hope that you end up at the Russell and you can get a dinner at the, <laughs> at the in, Russell um, in the locker room in the locker room. All right. Room at the Russell. That's a one shout out. And obviously you have to go to the Dunvegan and have a pint. Um, and if you are going to go and you're going to play golf and you get a caddy, just uh, follow their instruction and stay left every hole. Stay left. Don't go right. What if, what if you start hooking it too much? Uh, you still probably be okay. The fairways are so freaking wide open over there. But I remember I went with Rick Latin, and um, I can't do the Scottish accent. But the, the caddies over there, if you if you um, have a bag that's too full or too much crap in it, they'll just dump it all out on the ground and be like, "You can get that when we come back." Don't. <laughs> make your bag too <laughs> I remember um, Rick Latin must have hit a ball right and he's in the caddy said god damn it I told you you have the whole Scotland the whole, the whole of Scotland to your left and you right or something <laughs> it was like so funny and, and um, I don't think Rick was like used to the kind of caddies being um, you know not friendly and polite and nice like they're pretty they, they rib you pretty good um, so it should be fun and uh, you'll have a good time and I'm going to be over there too for the open for a few days so uh, hopefully you get to see some pretty good golf courses and play some good golf. And, um, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll share some pictures with us on social media and some other areas. So good deal. You've got the right job, John. I know. Well, <laughs> I'm going over there next week. So yours isn't so bad either. Yeah. All right, Eric, I appreciate it. Thanks again for joining us. And, um, I will say that we have another episode coming up here shortly on May 11th, which I think is Monday. And we'll be joined with Dr. Ben McGraw from Penn State. Uh, he'll be talking about some of the annual bluegrass weevil issues that are going on, as well as just insect control in lawns and turf in general. And so that'll be our next episode on Monday. So thanks, Eric, and we'll uh, see you next time. All right. Thanks much.